하루에 하루에 마루나 하루에 하루에 마루냐 하루에 Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Giraffe's Eggs and Other African Tales. I am Elim Daini, your host, a teacher by day and storyteller by night. I am also the author of the West African fable, Giraffe's Eggs. For today's story, we are traveling to the western side of the continent. We are going to Benin, the country. Some may associate it with the Dahomey Kingdom, which was part of modern-day Benin. There is also a city in Nigeria called Benin, populated by the Edo people. But today we are focusing on the country named after the body of water on which it lies. The Bite of Benin. Today's legendary person is not a ruler. It's not even a person. It's a group of people who became known to the world after fighting the French army and its African allies. Some Senegalese, Yoruba and Hausa troops rallied to conquer this dangerous, almost mythical unit without much success. This group of people have even influenced modern day culture. The Dora Milaje division from the movie Black Panther was inspired by this all-female military unit. This group dubbed as the Dahomey Amazons by European writers, are in fact called the Mino. Sources have said that the Mino did not start off as warriors, but as elephant hunters. King Huigbadia, who was king from 1645 to 1685, is said to have originally commissioned these women to supply ivory and meat for the court. They were known as the Beto back then. As their hunting missions required similar tactics to that of military attacks, Huig Badia's daughter, Queen Hangbe, ruling from 1708 to 1711, established the Beto as an elite all-female bodyguard squad. Her successors followed suit and King Gezo, who ruled the kingdom of Dahomey from 1818 to 1858, officially integrated the Beto into the army. They then became known as the Mino, our mothers in the Fon language. From the moment a young woman was selected to be a part of the hunting group, she was trained to be strong, fast, ruthless, and able to withstand great pain. Her exercises resembled a form of gymnastic, which included jumping over walls covered with thorny acacia branches. She would be sent on expeditions in the jungle, which could last up to 10 days without any supplies and only her machete and her will to survive. This was done until this young woman became fanatical about battle. Some of the recruits were as young as eight years old, while others were from the king's own harem. The Mino's first uniforms were antelope horns. This was to highlight their power and rank. The regiment had a semi-sacred status, which was intertwined with the firm belief in Vodou, before a battle commenced, the Mino would sing. They would sing about a variety of topics such as their superiority over men, their willingness to die for their king and kingdom, as well as their past victories and future battles. Often seen as the last warriors standing in battle, unless expressly ordered to retreat by their king, the Mino fought to the death. Defeat was never an option. A famous warrior by the name of Tata Ajaje was known for killing a man and beheading him with his own weapon during battle. 
It was often customary that they cut off their opponent's head or return with their opponent's genitals. The taking of Ketu, an ancient Yoruba kingdom, was an infamous victory for the Mino. This taking explains partly why many Yoruba natives were sent to Brazil as slaves. If they supported the old Yoruba empire, they would either be sent into slavery or beheaded. In 1764, the Mino also won the battle against the Ashantis to conquer the kingdom of Wida. But the vast majority of their battles were against the Yoruba people. At their height, they made up a third of the entire Dahomey army, 6,000 women strong. The Battle of Abeokuta was the demise of the Mino. They were so confident that they would take the city that they announced it twice. Having had such a huge renown within this region, the people of Abeokuta prepared themselves vigorously. When the Mino came to invade the city, they were met with fortified walls, carefully planned military action, and were ultimately defeated. Brazil is home uh, for many descendants of those from the Yoruba Kingdom, Ileife to be precise. And this is because, as I said earlier, Yoruba natives were sent to Brazil as enslaved Africans if they supported the old Yoruba Empire. On the battlefield, the choice was clear-cut, slavery or death. And this is the legacy of the Mino, women who meant business. The French army is quoted saying that the All Women Battalion gave proof of incredible courage and audacity, <laughs> and the fiercest, most determined adversaries were the Amazons. Now, the last minute on record was called Naoui. She died at the age of 100 years old in 1979 in a remote village that she was found living in. And I wish I could have met her, that she and her comrades had lived a bit longer. Um, my father is from Benin. He is of Bariba and Dendi descent. Dendi is a subgroup of the Shanghais. These two tribes are mostly found in the north of Benin, some in Togo, Niger and Nigeria, but my family lives in the south, in Cotonou. And thus, some people in my paternal family speak a little bit of Fon, as it is the main language of the South, as well as the language for trade. There are many stories that my paternal grandmother and my aunt have told me about our history, but I find this one one of the most fascinating. I wish more creative content was based on the Minnow, like the fictional Amazons of ancient Greece, but I guess that's why work like mine exists to remind the world of these incredible stories of our incredible history that deserves to be in history books and more widely known so yeah the minnow a name to remember In closing, I would like to thank Rohan, CEO of Noir Historia, for helping with the research of this episode. Noir Historia is a company that uncovers many black hidden figures that have contributed to many societies from centuries past to modern history. And Noir Historia has just released an exceptional black history trivia card game, which is interactive and great for families to use and test their knowledge, but also learn about worldwide black history together. And of course, I would like to thank Lupify Studio for the production of this episode. I reached out to them after experience burnout with creating this series and they have accepted to collaborate with me for which I'm so, so grateful. Lupify Media creates immersive stories using exciting sound effects, music and audio. So it is my pleasure to be working in collaboration with them. 
I really hope you enjoyed today's story and that you learned something new. I am Ellen Diany, author of the West African fable Giraffe's Eggs, available on Amazon. Go to the show notes to find out how to get your own copy. If you like and would like to support this podcast, please share it on social media and directly to your friends who love folklore. Also, consider reviewing it on your favorite listening platform. It's completely free and it really helps the show get more visibility without spending much money on publicity. Well, anyway, this has been our story of the week. A bientôt les amis. See you soon, friends. <laughs>